The title is uh, Geometric Approach to uh, Cohomology. Um, so just a few words. Um, so uh, the Bott and Schultz uh, a few years ago came up with uh, something they call prismatic cohomology. Um, its purpose was to unify the existing piatic cohomology theories, namely, especially crystalline cohomology and uh, local piatic et al. cohomology. Um, so this year at ANU, we, we are running a seminar, have been running a seminar um, on a, a reformulation due to Grinfeld. So he, um, he has a paper by now in the archive called uh, Prismatization and uh, where he, he reformulates their paper in um, what you might call more geometric terms. And uh, the goal here is to explain this. The goal of our seminar is to understand it. And the goal of this talk is to, uh, well, give you some idea of this. Okay, so um, let me give you a little overview. So there's a, a talk, this talk today, and then uh, next week, uh, Lance Gurney will give uh, will give the second talk. Talk. So there are two key points um, to that I, that I want to emphasize. The first one is that. Um, some important cohomology theories are just ordinary coherent cohomology, the cohomology of quasi-coherent sheaves or cohomology of vector bundles, but over exotic spaces. Are, um, so how did I want to say this? Um, are just the usual cohomology of quasi-coherent sheaves, vector bundles, if you like, but of exotic spaces. And these spaces will be all sorts of things, um, but I'll get into that more later. So for instance, uh, the Durham cohomology of X will be, I mean, I'm just gonna kind of write up some symbols the cohomology of something you might call the Durham space with coefficients in the structure sheet. So this is the coherent cohomology of this uh, exotic space, the Durham space. Similarly for crystalline, and finally, and this is the key point, which we'll get to in the next talk. For prismatic, so that's prismatic cohomologies written with a little prism uh, there. Okay, so this isn't saying that much, um, but there are these mysterious spaces here, uh, and we'll have to explain uh, what they are. Um, and kind of the point, I guess, or one of the points, is that all the complexity of the cohomology theory should be somehow encoded in this space because all you're left with at the end is coherent cohomology of that. So they're kind of kind of all the action has to be in the space itself. Okay, so today I want to talk about the general picture and illustrate this with, with Durham cohomology and depending how much time there is, what I'll call filtered Durham cohomology, by which I mean Durham cohomology with the Hodge filtration. Um, this, in, in some sense, it's kind of following very old uh, work, say, especially uh, Grothendieck and maybe also Berthelot, Arlo Simpson. Um, and the approach will really be informal. I just kind of want to give you a picture of things 
uh, to see how it works. Um, if you, uh, if I, if I <laughs> tried to give a super detailed talk, then, then nobody would enjoy it. Um, so, so today is informal. Uh, next week. <laughs> next week, after after everyone has come to love the subject this week, next week everyone will love a, a more serious talk. So, so this is prismatic, the prismatic theory, which which Lance will, Lance will talk about. Um, and this is, I think, I mean, this is where Grinfeld and maybe Balenson, maybe also uh, all these people when they give talks, everyone credits everyone else. So some subset of Balance and Grinfeld, uh, Bott and Lurie, uh, but let me just say, Grinfeld's the one with a, a written paper. Um, so uh, this is, uh, so, but, but today kind of the, the, really the ideals of Grinfeld won't come in so much. Um, so the second point I wanna emphasize uh, is, uh, is that each of these, Homology theories comes from a specific algebraic ring. And this was something kind of really new to me. Uh, I guess maybe this is also uh, a Grinfeld or Valence in point of view. Um, so uh, we're, I'm in Sydney, so everybody here likes algebraic groups, SL2 and things like this. Well, you can also have algebraic rings where, which are varieties where the ring operations are uh, morphisms of varieties and uh, algebraic rings don't get much um, much attention in, in, in mathematics, but uh, it's kind of amazing that um, if you fix an algebraic ring, it will kind of uh, in, a, in a relatively automatic way give you some homology theory. So the attention then kind of from my point of view, it shifts from these kind of maybe unwieldy cohomology theories to perhaps more humble uh, things like algebraic rings. Um, so what do I mean by an algebraic ring? I mean, th this will kind of change as what exactly I mean as, as time goes on. So, but a typical thing we might want to consider will be a simplicial ring scheme, commutative. So uh, in this talk, all rings and algebras will be commutative. Um, okay. Um, so before we get into it, I should probably make a remark on, on foundations. So if you have a, um, a variety or scheme, so X say defined by polynomial equations over some field or ring K, then this gives rise to a functor, the so-called functor of points, from uh, algebras over K to sets. And we continue to denote this X, uh, perhaps abusively. Um, and what does it do? It just, if you input a ring R, it, what it outputs is the, uh, there are various ways of thinking about it, but it's just the, uh, the, the perhaps the, the simplest way is just the solutions to the system of defining equations in R. So equals set of solutions to defining equations in R. So a good example would be SL2, right? SL2, just in the normal sense of the term, is a functor from, from rings. In fact, it goes to groups, but you can just imagine it going, going to sets. Uh, you input, it, so it has one defining equation. AD minus BC equals one. You input a ring, it outputs the set of all solutions to that equation in, uh, in, in the ring in question. So it sends the input ring as R, the output set is SL2 of R. In this case, it's an algebraic group. So in fact, it actually lands in groups, not just sets. Um, and okay, it's an algebraic group. Um, Soon, in a few minutes, I'll start considering algebraic rings. So these will be these will be functors which uh, uh, take an uh, input, which is a ring, and the output is another ring. Um, okay. So 
just a few words on that for those who aren't familiar with it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So all my rings are going to be two meters. Two by two matrices is not good, but uh, we could have, you know, if you like matrices, you could have matrices of this form. That's a nice, uh, nice commutative ring. Uh, so that would be three dimensional affine space and it has a ring structure. Or sorry, two dimensional A and B. Um, okay, and now the point is that um, X is determined by the functor. And in fact, we have a fully faithful embedding from, uh, sorry, uh, schemes or whatever kind of geometric objects we want to consider, say schemes over K to the category of functors from uh, algebras over K to sets. So with no harm at all, we can just think of any scheme or variety or whatever as, as a functor. We can identify the two. Um, so we, we lose no information. Um, so it, it is another way of saying it is it kind of realizes all of algebraic geometry just in the study of functors from, from algebras, commutative algebras to sets. Um, so that's kind of a, a nice thing. Okay, so um, that's just a little bit of category theory, basically. Um, it's kind of some version of the UNA dilemma, um, but it will make, it's really essential in everything I'm gonna do. Okay, so um, that's the end of the overview and the general remarks. So let me just say, um, I'll tell you something about Durham cohomology. I'll reinterpret it in this kind of uh, geometric way. And uh, that will lead us into this kind of general framework. So that's the purpose of the talk. Okay, so uh, I want to assume that the field, the base field is of characteristic zero. And let's say really mostly just for simplicity, we'll assume that uh, X is smooth over it. Um, then the Durham cohomology of X is defined to be the hyper cohomology of, of a certain complex, the Durham complex. Say the dimension of X is D. Um, okay, so, so that's what the Durham cohomology is. Uh, this is a, a, a vector space over K. Um, and that's a, a perfectly fine definition to do uh, just about anything you want with. Um, this, uh, there's a relative version. Suppose you have a smooth morphism. So, uh, intuitively, it's just a, 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 a morphism whose fibers are smooth. So it's kind of a, uh, a parameter space of, of the smooth of, of the fibers, which are all smooth. Um, and uh, then you can also define a relative one, which would be, um, write it this way, you take the uh, the higher direct images of the, the relative Durham complex. So maybe I should also assume it's proper just to be, uh, just to be safe. Um, so this is, um, th this is somehow, th this is a, now a vector bundle uh, on Y. The, the fiber at a given point is the Durham cohomology of the corresponding uh, 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 fiber of this morphism uh, over Y. And it has a, um, uh, it has an integral connection called the gauss manning connection. Um, so it's an integral, integral connection. So, um, you, what am I trying to say? Uh, the point is that this, um, that um, if, you, if you take fiber Y Durham cohomology, you'll get a bundle on Y, which is no longer, which is not necessarily trivial. Typically it won't be. If you have a family of elliptic curves over the modular curve, 
yeah, you, you get uh, a non-trivial bundle. It has this non-trivial connection on it, the Picard-Fuchs equation. Um, so you can see you want more general coefficients in, um, so you might then, you know, want to take the cohomology of fibers again. And this just makes it clear that you need some general system of coefficients uh, to, uh, to work with. Okay, so the, the uh, so somehow this is meant to just uh, illustrate the point that um, in, in the ROM cohomology, uh, the natural coefficient systems should be uh, vector bundles with an integrable connection. So now what is an integrable connection? Intuitively, it's um, some data on your vector bundle that allows you to identify any two infinitesimally near fibers of the vector bundle. So um, uh, for instance, if you're looking at kind of solutions to a differential equation, you can, um, you can extend them. Uh, so that's often how you get these things. Uh, but now we want to interpret that geometrically. Okay, so uh, an integrable connection. What is this? So the, the idea is um, an integral, integrable connection on a vector bundle E is uh, data identifying infinitesimally near fibers. Okay, so, uh, and now the point is that this extra ROM construction is a formalization of this. So let me now tell you what it is. Okay, so we'll define a subfactor. So this will be uh, the picture. Here's a, here's what x cross x looks like, and we want it to be. We have the the normal diagonal, and then we want our thing to be an infinitesimal neighborhood of of the diagonal, it's meant to be an equivalence relation, which will tell us when two point, I mean, a, a relation is just a sub-object of x cross x. It will tell us when two points are infinitesimally close. So how do we do that? Um, we define it as a functor as follows. So it will be It will be this fiber product of sets. So you have the, the, the set of solutions to your original equations with coordinates in R, then the uh, second copy, uh, another point with uh, another solution with uh, in R, but these two have to be the same solution when you pass to R red, which is R modulo the, the nil radical. So, in other words, the um, if you think about putting coordinates on everything, should I write so? Uh, if um, say x in affine n space is defined by some equations f sub j of x equals zero, then we can define. Uh, the, uh, this is, if you like, the infinite order infinitesimal neighborhood. Now I'll, I'll define here the rth order infinitesimal neighborhood in x cross x to be um, by the vanishing of the 
uh, a bunch of functions uh, like this. When, so any kind of, well, let's say, any, any, any nilpotent element, any, any element which has nilpotents of order bigger than R uh, will, will vanish on this locus. Um, okay, so this is the, the uh, so set of pairs of points at uh, order less than or equal to R distance from each other. Yeah. So um, the exponent and the one are just called in solitary for confidence. Uh, yes, th thank you. Yeah, that's right. So like x1 up to xn are the coordinates on the first one and y1 up to y, I mean, yeah, y1 up to yn will be the, the coordinates on the second one. So and then um, for the equations that they consider, they just, the well, it's just the additional equations uh, right, so it's uh, because because it lives in here, it will it will it has. So if you like, also, yeah, the equations f i x is zero and f i y equals. Maybe I should call that call it a j. That's right. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, and then. Um, the full infinitesimal neighborhood will be the union of these. So it's just the set of points in some rth order neighborhood uh, of the diagonal. So one thing that's worth emphasizing is that this is a nice scheme, um, but this right here, it's not actually a scheme. It's uh, it's a formal scheme or an end scheme. It's somehow an increasing union of schemes, um, but, uh, but, it, but, but that's kind of a, a technical thing that we don't really need to worry about. But if, you, uh, if so, anything bothers you about it, just pipe up and hopefully I'll be able to allay your fears. Okay, but the point is that now, um, even though you can think of all these as relations, so, you like delta x r, which is a it's closed subscheme of x cross x. So if you like, it's a it's a relation, a relation object, um, but it's not an equivalence relation because if you go a, a, an infinitesimal order r distance and an infinitesimal order s distance from that, it won't be, or say, an, you, you do r and then you do r again, it won't be the total will be. Uh, infinitesimal distance to R in general. So you need to take the union of all of them to, to make an equivalence relation, but uh, it is. I mean, you can, you can also see quite easily that this defines for each R, it defines an equivalence relation because it's just pairs of points, which are the same up to nilpotents. So if, you, if your X was like SL2, just be pairs of matrices, which when you reduce all the entries of the matrix, modulo any nilpotents in your ring, you get, you get the same matrix. So the point is that this is an equivalence relation on X. It's, it's a, and it's, a, it's an equivalence relation object in the category of functors. Um, these functors from rings to sets. Okay, so now let's, uh, so that was a little bit of a, uh, uh, an introduction to uh, well, uh, this equivalence relation. Um, so now suppose M, let's get back to connections. So, we, we, so, so this is the equivalence relation that formalizes what it means for two points to be infinitesimally close to each other. So now suppose M is a quasi coherent sheaf on X, then, um, A set of integrable connections on M is naturally in bijection to the set of uh, how do I want to put it actions of 
delta x hat on m. So what do I mean by this? Um, this, uh, like any equivalent, any equivalence relation is a group weight. Um, so if you don't know what a group weight is, not to worry. So there are two projections. So this, right, it projects onto, onto each factor. And uh, an action of this groupoid on, on M is, well, intuitively, it's if you have, what is it? It's an identification of, uh, of, of the fibers of M whenever X and Y are, are related in the equivalence relation, are infinitesimally close. Um, what does that mean formally? It just means that you have a map from S upper star of M to T upper star of M. Um, and, uh, okay, I'll, there's also a, an associativity condition, a co-cycle condition. So if you, have, if you have three points which are related, then the isomorphism you get from one pair composed of the isomorphism from the second pair agrees with the isomorphism from the third pair. Um, so this is, uh, you can define what it means for any group, groupoid over X to act on say a quasi coherent sheaf on X. And here, this is a little exercise. If you, if you know the ordinary definition of an integrable connection, you can, uh, first you have to make sense of what this map is. That's part of the exercise, but then you prove it. The proof is not hard. The proof is, the proof is basically Newton's observation that somehow derivatives and nilpotents do the same thing. Like if you, if you have a, right, x plus epsilon to the n is equal to x to the n plus epsilon and x to the n minus one. Somehow, uh, in some sense, the whole point of differential calculus from this point of view is uh, just gives you a way of handling nilpotent elements. Um, so this is, is, well, I'll leave that as an exercise. Okay, so um, let me now, so, so one way to, to think about the data of an integrable connection, I mean, the usual way is with a, a connection operator, like a differential operator. I won't talk about that at all. Another way is an action of this groupoid, which happens to be an equivalence relation. Um, one way to think about this, yet another way that will be useful. Uh, so that's the same thing as uh, realizations of M along equivalence classes. Intuitively, if you if you identified the fibers of M over any two equivalent points and you do that in a way, in a, in a coherent way, then you've effectively trivialized M along every equivalence class. Um, and so another way of thinking about this is uh, Oh yeah, there's that. Yeah, I, I had associativity, but I should have also said the identity. So yeah. Uh, um, so another way of thinking about this is just uh, the quasi-coherent sheaves on the quotient. If something's trivialized along each orbit, so to speak, um, then it will descend. It descends canonically to the quotient. Um, so. And, and this is what the space X is. So X -rom is X modulo the equivalence relation where any two infinitesimally near points are identified. Um, that is kind of a weird thing if you think about it from kind of standard point set topology, uh, manifolds and things like that. But um, given kind of the, this, this functorial setup is very, is very supple and you can kind of make perfectly good sense out of things like this. Um, another way of thinking about it, which maybe I should have written first, is um, equivariant quasi-coherent sheaves on X. So equivariant, not with respect to a group action. Normally you have a, a group acting on X and uh, then you talk about equivariant quasi-coherent sheaves. This is a, a groupoid, and it's a very particular kind of groupoid. It's, a, it's an equivalence relation, but the, the formalism is 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 the same. Uh, 
Uh, no, I mean, if you like, it's an actual quotient in, so maybe the best way to say it, it's the, it's the associated sheaf. To the functor. Which sends R, uh, X of R, mod, uh, delta X hat of R. So it's, yeah, you, you put some topology, say the atal topology on the category of affine schemes and then, but, but it's, it, it, in the end, it's just a functor. So you, you can take a perfectly good quotient in, in, in the functor category. Uh, so it's, um, right. So what is, what is the usual hierarchy look like? You have affine schemes, say, then you have, uh, Projectives, I guess that fine are not projective, sorry. I mean, I should have said quasi-projective. Uh, quasi-projective, then you have all schemes, and uh, then you have algebraic spaces, and then say stacks. Um, these would be, so there's, there's kind of a big jump here because the points and stacks can have uh, morphisms. So this, because we've modded out by an equivalence relation and not Equivalent relations have no fixed points, uh, unlike group actions. Um, so it, two points are equivalent or they're not. They, a point can't be equivalent to itself in multiple ways, uh, unlike if you have a group action with isotropy. Um, so it would be, um, so the, it, it, it would be in here, um, a sheaf. I mean, in, in the end, when you when you're working with it, you're just going to kind of work uh, uh, delta hat equivariantly on it. But but it is a real thing. Uh, so so one one doesn't need to be uh, too sheepish when talking about it. The qu the question was, um, what is the ROM about um, about all this? I guess right. Is that what you're so? The the point is that the the coefficients. The natural systems of, of coefficients in Durham cohomology are like you cannot just take the you can take of course you can take the Durham cohomology of, of a variety, but you can also take the Durham cohomology of any vector bundle with connection with integrable connection on your variety, and that actually is that's the natural notion of coefficient system for Durham co it's the natural notion of local system in in Durham cohomology, but and that can be re-expressed. This is sort of some kind of funny data with differential forms and an obla and things, some things like this. You can kind of re-express it as simply an ordinary quasi-coherent sheaf on an exotic space, or as an action of some some groupoid. So it's it's kind of a um, yeah, it's it's kind of a more geometric thing. Um, I don't know. If it's, okay. Um, Okay, and then, so then the point of all this is that the Durham cohomology of X is canonically identified with the delta hat equivariant cohomology of the structure sheet. And that's sort of essentially by definition, the coherent cohomology of X Durham with coefficients in the structure sheet on it. So this is not, um, this, this Durham cohomology was defined in a funny way with this explicit complex, which kind of came out of nowhere. Um, so this does require a little bit of an argument. Um, so you, you reduce this to the, the formal completion of, of affine space, and then, then it's a calculation, the so-called formal Poincaré law. That, that this thing will have uh, trivial Durham cohomology in, in either of these in either of these senses. Okay, so that yeah, again, the point of that whole discussion was that somehow uh, Durham cohomology with its natural coefficient system can be kind of naturally understood as just ordinary equivariant cohomology or the cohomology of some crazy object. So the second point, so if you like that would go under little Roman, Roman numeral one, according to the two key ideas I said at the beginning. The second point is um, 
algebraic rings. Okay, so um, the point is this, this groupoid that I, this equivalence relation here, um, it wasn't, I mean, uh, I could, uh, met, you, could, you can talk about random groupoids, random equivalence relations on X, but this is a very specific naturally constructed one. So in what sense is it natural? Um, let's just think about what it is. So um, a point in the infinitesimal neighborhood of the, the diagonal is, well, what is it? It's, it's two, two points of X. which agree modulo nil potents. Yes. Uh, yeah, I said, uh, I think in the beginning, K was the field of characteristic zero. Um, yeah, so that, that, uh, that's, that's coming up, yep. Um, Right. Okay, Th um, this you can, uh, a little exercise shows if, if X is uh, a scheme or something, that th this is the same thing as So, so what are, th this is, uh, you can, I don't know, you might as well think of SL2 or something. Two matrices, two matrices in SL2 with, with entries in R, which agree modulo nail potents. That's the same thing as one matrix with entries in pairs of elements of R, which agree modulo nil potent. Um, so this is somehow, uh, for affine schemes, this is kind of automatically true and a little bit of thought can convince you it's true for, for any scheme. Um, and now I'm going to reformulate this one more time. So that is uh, X of, G A of R where G A by by G A and this so G A usually means the additive group for me uh, in this talk will be it's just a line, so it's just A one, but as a ring scheme. So even though the G is for group, I'm gonna just continue, I'll just think of GA as a ring scheme. So G, the, the R points in a lot, like that's the solution in one variable of no equation. So you, you just, that GA of R is just R. GA is the identity functor, if you like. Um, and uh, so, so this is just uh, another way of saying that. And this is delta hat sub GA of R. So it's a little funny. Normally, um, when you when you take some variety x and you substitute in a ring, you get the set of solutions to the defining equations. But because G A is a ring scheme, when you substitute in in a ring, you actually the output is still a ring. Uh, just like if you have a group, if you if SL two, you substitute in a ring, you, the output's a group. Uh, if you have a ring scheme, you substitute in a ring, the output's a ring. And um, yeah, so, so, okay, so the point is that delta x hat is equal to x composed of delta g a hat. So this is kind of a weird thing. So this, this makes sense because delta g a hat is a and well, I'll say an algebraic ring. It's actually not, it's an indie scheme. So it's not technically, it's not a scheme. Uh, so let me just speak loosely. It makes sense because this is an algebraic ring. So there's this funny thing you can do given these foundations that, that we have that, um, so we can pre-compose Any variety, I'll just, I don't know what the term variety means, but so I'm allowed to kind of use it loosely. Uh, we can precompose any variety 
with an algebraic ring to make a new one. Which is kind of a weird thing. Um, so I guess the analog would be that, you know, you can have, if we, if you, we took that ring scheme of those matrices, it's commutative, and then we substitute in, sub composed it with itself. Um, what would we get? I guess we would get something like this. Um, so I'll call it alpha, beta, alpha, zero, alpha, beta, alpha, zero, um, uh, whatever, uh, gamma, delta, zero, gamma, which is yet another ring scheme. So it's, 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 kind, of, um, it's kind of a weird thing, but um, the, I, as far as I know, in other forms of geometry, you, I don't know, if you have a, a, a topological ring and then you have a, a space, can you, can, you, can you combine the two in such a way to make a new space out of it? Um, it's, it's kind of a weird thing, but you can, you can definitely do it. Um, in this setting. Um, okay, so let me actually introduce, let's call this variety X and I'll call our algebraic ring D and the new one will be X sub D. Um, so let me try to unpack this a little bit more. So this is, this is for me, it's just kind of this, I mean, I guess this literal point I knew, uh, which, but it always did amaze me. But then the, then the cool thing, which kind of I learned from Grunfeld is that, um, that then you can take the cohomology of XD and get the new, uh, an exotic cohomology. So then given D, the co coherent cohomology of, X key is an exotic. Exotic is just for fun. Uh, uh, it is an exotic cohomology theory. Uh, it depends on X. So the slogan is that algebraic rings, commutative algebraic rings, give rise to cohomology theories. So this, this should be understood kind of in the loosest possible sense. So, um, Another way of thinking about an algebra, so, so this uh, delta hat GA, what was that? That was the, um, it, as a functor, you input a ring and you output pairs of elements of that ring, which agree modulo nilpotent. So this is a perfectly good uh, new ring and um, you can, so you, you can think of this, this ring scheme, this algebraic ring as a, a natural way of constructing new rings from old rings. So just like certain rings, have natural ideals like the nil radical, certain things like this, which are, I don't know, people don't normally um, define them. Certain, you know, groups have not, like you can talk about the, the center of a group, there's certain natural constructions uh, in various categories. Um, if you have, if you have a, a ring scheme, an algebraic ring, well, there's, we'll think of these as loosely corresponding to uh, natural ways of constructing new rings from old rings. So one natural way is you give me a ring, I give you the ring of ordered pairs of elements which are which agree modulo nilpotents. And then the great thing is that that, I mean, this is something you could explain in the 
in a first algebra class, in algebra one. Uh, but then this gives you automatically. So uh, this natural construction, or well, such a natural construction, in particular, this one, uh, then formally gives rise to a cohomology theory. And in this case, which is this pretty humble construction, but also not completely uh, uh, brain dead construction, um, gives rise to draw on cohomology. Then the, the point, so, uh, so to do it better, we want to make everything simplicial, which I mostly won't do in this talk. But then the whole point of this is now it re refocuses attention from the cohomology theories to these algebraic rings, which are much more humble objects, I guess. So our, the, the question is uh, which algebraic rings give rise to interesting cohomology theories? For instance, we might want the, the cohomology of uh, our variety, which say we assume it's smooth and proper, to be finitely generated. That's a pretty humble, um, so which this, this is like a very um, kind of a soft picture, uh, but we might hope to answer in terms of the algebraic rings when interesting properties of cohomology theory, when, when they give rise to cohomology theories with certain interesting properties. So what's the, um... Okay, so how, from, how do I get the problem? Like with the two-sentence summary, how do you start with that uh, algebraic ring and then yeah. get your problem? Uh, so let's, let's call this algebraic ring. This is D of R. Okay. So, um, the two protections. Give you those maps there, and this is just the same thing. So that's just the same data. So it's, it's by precomposing. It's by, if you precompose with this algebraic ring, you'll get uh, a new, a crazy new geometric object. In this case, it also comes with two projections. So you get this data, and that's a groupoid. Then you take equivariant cohomology of X with respect to that. But if you had some crazier simplicial thing, you can get a much crazier natural construction, a much, much crazier thing built out of X, and then you take cohomology of that simplicial object. And are there versions of this like in non-geometric settings? Like is there, I mean, it's, it's always a very yeah. categorical framework. I don't know, I guess. I do think that this, this, this sort of this category theoretic picture on geometry hasn't run its course. Uh, like I have this kind of side project to do the foundations of this for semi rings. So you don't want to, you know, to be able to do everything without using subtraction. Uh, um, and I, I don't know if you did it for groups or something like. Yeah, like a group call. Okay, so uh, now let me do some ex more examples. This will be kind of uh, light. So the first example will be the same one I've been doing all along, but let me, I'm just gonna kind of sum up uh, what, what I was saying. Um, so there are a few points of view here. That one is we have uh, a natural way of making equivalence relation on varieties. This is the formal completion of the diagonal uh, with the two projections. Uh, second point of view, so this is kind of 
think of it as one object. Uh, second point of view is we can take its quotient, extra ohm, which has really the same information, more or less, as, uh, as, as this object here. But it, you know, this, what the point is, this is kind of some p small piece of a simplicial thing, but this is just a single object. So maybe it's a, a, little, a little more manageable from certain points of view. Um, second point of view is um, we have uh, algebraic rings, or rather a diagram of algebraic rings. So this will be delta hat sub GA with two maps to GA. So this is kind of what this, the totality of the whole thing, which is some little piece of a simplicial object is maybe what I would have called D before. So, uh, so that's what I was talking about over here, but I, um, I, I was kind of implicitly including the two projections as, as I uh, uh, wrote here. And then we have a, um, a kind of, natural equivalence relation on, on rings. Let me erase this. Which is that X is equivalent to Y if and only if their difference is nilpotent. And these are just kind of four different ways of, of saying the same thing. Um, but the point is that if you, if we focus on this one, for, then we can pre-compose any given variety with that. So we would get X composed delta hat sub GA, two projections to X sub GA. And then this by the whole discussion in the first half of the talk is this, this is X and this, uh, this is the thing whose quotient is, is X Durham and the coherent cohomology of this is, is the Durham cohomology. So somehow this humble gadget of algebraic rings, if you apply this procedure to it, namely pre-compose everything in sight, pre-compose X with every, everything here, we get a new diagram of schemes or generalized schemes. And we either take the cohomology of that as viewed as some simplicial object or in certain cases, we can just pass to a quotient and take the cohomology of that thing, and that will give us our new cohomology theory. So that's that's the framework. Okay, so let me uh, I'll also do example zero, which is a little stupid, which is coherent cohomology itself. Uh, then um, then just x the x sub co will just be x itself and our algebraic ring will just be GA, which is the identity factor. So we're kind of not, not doing anything. Uh, so it's not so impressive to reduce coherent cohomology of X to coherent cohomology of some scheme, just, which happens to be X. Uh, so, uh, but it is kind of case example number zero. Um, so what about crystalline cohomology? Crystalline cohomology fits in the same framework. So crystalline cohomology is loosely the ROM cohomology and characteristic P. So the problem with the ROM and characteristic P is that um, you can have differential forms like this, uh, which, uh, which are certainly closed and look like they should be exact, um, any first year calculus student could, can, uh, can integrate that if, if they know what differential form means. Uh, but, um, but, but this is not exact, not, uh, not exact because so we need um, constructions like this to, uh, to get the dimensions of Brahm cohomology that we would expect. So we can, I'll just, I'll just cut to the chase and tell you, uh, tell you what the, um, the algebraic ring 
construction is that gives rise to crystalline cohomology. Ah, yeah, definitely. Uh, so the question was whether you could, with this approach, can you take Drom cohomology of vector bundles with values, take Drom cohomology of a space with coefficients in a vector bundle with an integrable connection? And the answer is yes, because you can, for any quasi coherent, a quasi coherent chief on X Drom is the same thing as I kind of discussed in the beginning as a a quasi-coherent sheaf on X together with a, a delta X hat equivariant structure, which is the same thing as an integrable connection. Um, so if you just take the coherent cohomology, so like the Gram cohomology of X, the coefficients in a flat vector bundle will be the same as the coherent cohomology of X to Rom with values in the quasi-coherent sheaf on extra arm corresponding to this. So I'm not sure what to call that. Um, let me just, well, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just call it that. So the flat connection is, is the scent data from X, X down there. So it's, so it really is just, this is coherent cohomology. So um, the, there's a whole, the whole coefficient system works just fine. Um, Okay, uh, so what we do, um, let me define a natural construction on rings again. So let me first do it kind of loosely. So we'll look at pairs of elements of R. Now, rather than the difference being nilpotent, what we want is that um, all the divided power, we want divided powers. So let me just put it this way. Um, Ah, sorry, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. So um, if if R had no P power torsion, then you could you could make sense of this statement. Uh, so th these are saying all the divided powers uh, are in R. The right way to do it um, is to look at triples, uh, uh, not triples, uh, infinite triples, sorry, uh, in R to the infinity, such that um, Z0 is X minus Y. And then um, this, this whole thing is meant to be uh, Zn and the relations that you need to impose are that um, Zn to the Zn to the power p uh, Zn plus one and there's a p somewhere which is it should be down here so it should be over here. Uh, so this is the, uh, that's Zn to the power of P. So this is the, um, it's something like an equivalence relation, uh, but it's actually not because there, there are many ways, there are many witnesses, so to speak, to the equivalent, if two elements X and Y are equivalent, there can be many different Zs that, that realize that. Um, so you can check. PD is an algebraic ring, or rather just PD of R is a ring. So the ring operations are given are the component wise ones with respect to X and Y. And to work out what they are for the Zs, you have to, um, you kind of have to use certain, these, these formulas and then cancel denominators uh, or cancel divide. You'll have P's everywhere and you can just divide out by them. Um, yeah, so then, uh, then we have two projections, the GA, the projection onto the X component 
and the projection onto the Y component. Those are both homomorphisms of algebraic rings. And then you apply the same game that we did over here. Uh, you you pre-compose your variety with um, with each of the with the two algebraic rings. Maybe I'll write it out. And then of course, it's just X again. This will give you a, a groupoid over X and the corresponding cohomology theory is crystalline cohomology. So again, the point of all this is that, um, you know, there are big fat books on crystalline cohomology, but at least to get things up and running, the, the input is entirely category theoretic, except this precise natural construction, or I guess it's rather this one. This is the real definition. Uh, it's some natural way of producing new rings out of old rings. Um, and that gives rise to crystalline cohomology. Uh, uh, I guess you could. So one thing is that, that it's maybe a good thing to say is that this was, is not an equivalence relation. So this is a groupoid because the, as I was saying before, there, there can be many different witnesses to the equivalence of X and Y. So two, two points can be equivalent in multiple ways. So then if you, if you take the quotient, then, then this would be a stack of, of some kind. Um, so you can, if, if you like stacks, you can, uh, you can deal with that, or you can just kind of work equivariantly with, with the group weight action. Um, I think once things start getting more and more complicated, then rather than these little diagrams with two arrows, you'll have uh, big simplicial objects. And then, then I guess you need to go to infinity stacks or something like that. But um, so I somehow prefer to avoid the stack language for the most part. Um, okay, let me, Okay, I'll, I'll keep it kind of quick. So the prismatic is next time. But the point is that D, this algebraic ring or simplicial ring scheme uh, is, will just be more complicated. Um, here's another example, which is, uh, I think it's fair to call it a toy. Ah, yeah. Yeah, right. So this is, uh, I'm being a little loose here. Um, so, so this is a, um, this is, uh, I guess it would be a simplicial, um, FP algebra scheme. Um, so, uh, um, yeah. Okay. Let me let me say something. So, in general, if if D is a um, A algebra scheme over over A, then um, if we compose, take X composed with D, um, what can we do? Uh, we can we can input um, it's over A, so we we input A algebras. So this will go from A, a algebras, and then you apply D to it and you get out a K algebra. And then you apply X to it and you get a set. So this will give a method. So, so pre-composing with D will take you from um, schemes over K and you output schemes over A. 
So, uh, and then when you take the coherent cohomology here, so say we call this thing X sub D, I think I did that before. So then the coherent cohomology of X sub D is an A module. So, and, and we can apply it and this works for any scheme X over, over K and a priori K and, uh, K and A have nothing to do with each other. So um, what, uh, how is that going to work out here? So um, our, our, our D, which is, the simplicial thing is, um, so, okay. Be because the number P itself has all divided powers, um, if two, if two, uh, elements of the integers are congruent modulo p, then you can make all of these divided powers out of it. So you have this, so, um, sorry, this should be an R. Um, so this is a simplicial resolution of, of FP. So in, in some suitable technology, this, uh, this simplicial ring scheme is actually uh, lies over FP. Um, so th I guess that explains why, uh, why the input to crystalline cohomology, this X, so this is, so therefore, uh, so this is somehow saying K is, is FP. Um, so now, but Jordy's question was, uh, why is a, uh, ZP, um, Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Lance, do you know? I don't, he's muted. <laughs> I mean, isn't A is just ZP here? You're just putting ZP, well, right? I mean, okay, R yeah, yeah, that, yeah, you can, okay, you can make it work for it, but then why can't, why, why not work? I mean, I think if, I, f I find that an unsatisfactory, <laughs> I mean, you can just restrict, yeah, so you, it's, uh, Oh, okay, so you can observe, okay, fair enough. So you can observe that um, that uh, this makes sense for any, well, you just restrict this function to ZP algebras, um, but uh, there's gotta be a better answer than that, right? I, th I think you just don't get anything interesting if it's not uh, like a ZP algebra. I think that's- Okay, so Lance says that, um, you know, you just, so so R, the, the, the test rings R, are restricted to be uh, uh, A algebras. So you can just run this whole machine rather than for all rings uh, R, you just run it for ZP algebras. And then you're going to get uh, a scheme over ZP. So it's coherent cohomology will be over ZP. So then I guess the Jordy's question then becomes, well, the, why, why doesn't, why isn't crystalline, co why don't you do crystalline cohomology with integer coefficients from this point of view with, with A equal, with A equals Z. And I guess the answer is that you could, it just wouldn't give you anything good. If you wanted to do it, um, more generally with, uh, with, with uh, finite field FQ and then a, the big sectors of FQ, um, I guess it would just be, well, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I'm afraid I, I have to think about it. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think you, you can do every, there are sort of infinite variations on the theme, right? I, I think is sort of the. Yeah, so Lance yeah. points out you can do infinite variations on the theme, but it's somehow not, if you wanted to make it really work, 
<laughs> yeah, if you actually wanted to do it. Uh, I think it would just require some very minor tweaks, but I haven't, haven't thought about it yet. Okay. Um, right. Uh, so let me give one quick super toy example. Um, just uh, not because it's interesting, I haven't worked out the cohomology theory, uh, but just to give you yet another example of a canonical natural equivalence relation on, on rings you could have. Here, so here's a, here's a toy. Um, so say for, for, if R is an FP algebra, then we can say two elements of R are equivalent if and only if their pth powers are equal. And um, in other words, they become equal under the Frobenius map. So then you can, uh, you can, uh, I don't know what we should call it, maybe D1 of R will then be the, 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 the graph of the equivalence relation, if you like, will be a sub ring of R cross R. And then, so then we have, you can perform the, the, the same construction and uh, we get these funny algebraic rings. Of, of course, actually D1, what is it? It's just the P minus first infinitesimal neighborhood of the diagonal in GA, which, so I, I said before, if you look at the rth infinitesimal neighborhood, it won't be an equivalence relation, but in characteristic P, if you look at the P minus first, it is. So if, if, if X to the P is equal to Y to the P and Y to the P is equal to Z to the P, then uh, then x to the p is equal to z to the p. Um, sorry, I guess a, a better way of saying that is um, this this preserves all the ring structures. So if uh, we're not just saying that x this is equivalent to the difference uh, being zero. So so um, if uh, this is a ring. Um, this is a subring of this. If you if you did the analogous thing in characteristic zero, it wouldn't be a subring. So it would be an equivalence relation, but not a subring. You need it to be both. Another thing you could do in characteristic zero is say, uh, also the equivalence of those two is not the same. So, so in, in characteristic zero, this would be um, uh, well behaved in some respects, but it, it wouldn't give you a subring. Um, it, wouldn't, it also wouldn't give you an equivalent theory. Um, okay, so so um, I don't know which cohomology theory does it give rise to. It should be something relatively simple, um, but it would be kind of fun to just unpack everything and see what it is. The last example I wanted to say something about was the Hodge filtration. And the Hodge filtration. So in the discussion we had before, I, um, the, uh, we had the, the connections were there and um, the Gauss-Mani connection, I didn't say it, if you have a morphism, then you get a morphism between the Durham spaces and then if you have a quasi coherent sheaf here, you can push it forward here and you'll get one here, which is a vector bundle with connection. And that corresponds to the Gauss-Mannian connection. Um, but uh, some, there's something important in the, in the picture of Durham cohomology, which is missing and that's the Hodge filtration. So you can also bring that in. And um, let me just say quickly how that works since I'm running out of time. Um, so you might recall that graded vector spaces, category of it, graded vector spaces is the same thing as GM representations. So the grading is given by the, the, the weights uh, the, the, of the different characters of GM, which are integers, integer, if you like, uh, integer graded vector spaces. Um, for filtered vector spaces, this is, almost the same as uh, GM variant quasi-coherent sheaves on the affine line. 
So GM acts on FI mine by the usual scalar multiplication. And um, a, uh, you can ask for a quasi-coherent sheaf to have a GM equivariant structure. And this is the same as putting a filtration on the vector space, except the, the inc there's one caveat that if the, the inclusion maps from one degree of the filtration to the next one don't necessarily have to be injective. So maybe I should say quasi filtered vector spaces. And these are the same thing as graded AT modules, where T is in degree one. And another way of saying this is these are quasi-coherent sheaves on the stack A1 mod GM. So if we want the output of our cohomology theory to be not just a, a vector space over K, but a filtered vector space over K, then the uh, standard way of doing that would be to work over that and try to get a module over that, a quasi-coherent sheaf over that. Now the point is we can do that. Point is that this comes with a filtration. Recall that it was just the union of the rth order infinitesimal neighborhoods. At the if we if we substitute in our ring, remember. Um, so so what is this? This is pairs of elements x comma y, which agree modulo nilpotence. Uh, th this would consist of pairs of elements whose, which agree modulo nilpotence of order r. So that if, if you write out the definition of nilpotent, at some point you have to use an existential quantifier and you quantify over integers. There exists an integer n such that x to the n equals zero. So somehow you can even read it right out of the definition, like syntactically from the definition that this construction naturally comes with a filtration. So it's kind of uh, reasonable to hope that not only uh, you know, did not only, so we, we wanted a filtration to make this work, but even if we didn't know about the Hodge filtration and never heard of it, just even the, the definition of the word nilpotent kind of makes it clear that there's some uh, filtration there lurking behind the scenes. And in fact, just cut to the chase. So delta, delta hat GA extends to so this is this is groupoid over G A. This extends to groupoid delta tilde over G A, but now uh, over uh, let's call this base S. So now over S. And um, so let me tell you what th this again, once again, is a, an algebraic ring. So let me tell you the functor it represents for a K T algebra R. The tilde R is the set of pairs. So let me state it loosely first. The set of pairs in R2 such that X minus Y on T is nilpotent. Of course, that uh, doesn't make sense. So the real definition is the set of triples. If, if uh, R is T torsion free, then it does make sense. And even somehow this, this somehow uh, pre-definition restricted to the T torsion free context, in fact, will formally give rise to the following one. So it's, uh, it's not even so misleading to write this at first. Uh, X minus Y equals 
TZ, where Z is nilpotent. And this um, is a ring. The, the ring operations are component-wise in X and Y, and then you just have to work out from this what the corresponding uh, ring operations will be in Z. Z will look something like a derivative. Well, additively, it's, it's fine, but with respect to multiplication, Z will kind of look like a derivation. So uh, X, Y, Z times X prime, Y prime, Z prime, and the Z component, there will be something looking like a Leibniz rule. Um, Okay, so this is an algebraic ring. Um, we have uh, we have uh, algebraic ring homomorphisms uh, like this, and it's also um, it, there's there's uh, it's, everything is GM equivariant. The um, how that works is that so T. Uh, T is degree one uh, in, in this whole setup. So uh, X and Y are degree zero and Z is degree minus one. Um, so, so everything descends uh, to, um, so, so everything is defined over this, over this S. That's, that's the category of GM, GM equivariant things over A1. And the, uh, so then the corresponding Exotic space uh, that our that a scheme X gives rise to we can call it X sub Ilderom, and it's just the uh, simplicial one, which is X composed of delta tilde and the two projections to X. And uh, once again, just like in a crystalline setting, if so, if T is invertible, then um, then Z is uniquely determined, right? It's just X minus Y divided by T. But if T is not invertible, then uh, I mean, for instance, T could be zero, in which case there are many choices of, of Z giving rise to the same thing. So uh, so this is not this is a groupoid. but not an equivalence relation over the locus t equals zero. So when you take the quotient, if you can just, if you like, you could define x sub tilde rom to be the quotient by this groupoid, it'll be some stack, uh, but it definitely will be a stack. So there will be uh, the, some points, points will have isotropy groups, non-trivial isotropy groups. And, then quasi coherent sheaves on X sub tilde rom become the same thing as quasi coherent OX modules plus a filtration plus uh, an integrable connection and satisfying Griffith's transversality. That's just. Um, saying that the connection and the uh, filtration behave well with respect to each other, that the derivations only move the filtration by one degree. Um, and then one thing nice about this setup is that if you, if you have a morphism, which is say smooth and proper, then you get another morphism, uh, maybe I'll call it F bar on X sub tilde rom mapping to Y sub the ROM, and then you can take the relative uh, homology of, say, just the structure sheaf. You could do it for any coefficient system. Then this will be the uh, well. It'll be uh, some complex here, which will be the. Uh, I'll just put it this way: the the relative Durham cohomology, but it has all of these extra structures kind of automatically that's built into the geometry. So plus, plus it's Hodge filtration, plus Hodge, the, plus the Gauss-Mannion connection, 
and the two satisfy Griffith's transversality. So Hodge, Gauss, Mani, and Griffiths are kind of all automatic just from, from the setup. Okay, so uh, that's what I wanted to say. The, the key takeaway is that um, using this kind of, uh, using groupoids and simplicial constructions, you can kind of pack a lot of the complexity of, a, uh, of these, these rich algebraic cohomology theories into the space itself. And um, once you do that, many things uh, come automatically. And secondly, and perhaps, I mean, for me, that's a little bit old hat, but the uh, the amazing thing I think is that uh, these sophisticated algebraic cohomology theories are controlled by um, pretty humble algebraic rings. Um, okay, that's it. Thank you. Um, I don't know. It's it's very very beautiful talk. Thank you. Um, so I remember when I first read Simpson's paper about mix mix hodge structures and um, and um, and bundles on P1. Okay, you, you might be quickly beyond my depth, but ask anyway. Like, I, I don't know, you just have this amazing thing that like out of a complex algebraic variety, you get some interesting equivariant vector bundle on P1. And so I'd kind of dreamed that there's actually a way of kind of, that there is a space mapping to P1 such that you get this just as the direct image of the structure sheet or something. And that's exactly what you're doing here. I see. So is that so? Uh, for A one, I, I did it for A one, but he does. He, he says it actually extends naturally to P one. Is, is that what happens? Yeah, I think his point is that if you look at like, so P one, if you look at this funny the twister form of P one over R, uh huh, um, then you get and you formulate what it means to be a GM equivariant vector bundle on this this P1, then you get exactly a real mixed Hodge structure. Uh-huh, okay. Um, and I think if you, base, if you base change to C and then restrict to one of your standard charts of P1, then you get this story, story here. Yeah, right. 